tonight. Welcome to Providence Church Coatesville. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm going to ask you guys, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you guys to stand together with us as we pray and as we worship the Lord. We do have the tallest person in the whole room in front of the camera. So you might have to scoot over a little. You might have to switch, switch chairs. But let's, um, let's pray. Thank the Lord for his, um, his faithfulness, his goodness to us. Um, crazy storms came through. How many people got caught in the rain today? And now it's beautiful out. How many people are ready for warm weather? Right? That's still depressing that it's this cold in April. But, um, man, it's good that it's light out, that we get to be together, to worship together. And, um, man, we're, we're going to be blessed tonight. We have tonight with us, um, I'm just going to introduce you before you um, lead it, before I pray and before you leave. This is Matthew Schuler. He's a great friend of ours. Amen. And um, he's actually a part of a church planning team himself up in Brooklyn, um, New York. They're just in the early stages and um, meeting for, what, a year now? Probably uh, no, not even we, a year. We started meetings in January. In January. <laughs> so Bible studies, yeah. a few months. Um, we met him through Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia. He's come, he's come to the camp and led worship with the kids in Coatesville. He's been at Providence, Westchester. Um, you might have seen him on um, NBC's The Voice. That's where me and Jordan fell in love with him. So we're going to be blessed tonight by him just leading us in worship. So sing your hearts out tonight. Let's pray. God, there's so much that we could thank you for tonight. And despite so many circumstances that I'm sure and, and burdens that are on people's hearts, I know there's people that walked in here tonight with heaviness with burdens, being overwhelmed by the issues of life. And so, Lord, that's a present reality in many of our hearts and lives. But, Lord, you said that you would take that burden and place it upon yourself. For your burden is light, Lord God. And so, Lord, I pray that we would lay our burdens, lay our uh, trials, our struggles, the issues of life, At the foot of the cross, Lord God. Lord, may you be Lord over all. Lord, we thank you for your faithful hand. We thank you that 2,000 years later, you are still building your church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So, Lord, despite all the sin in the world that we see, despite all the brokenness, Lord, You are preserving a faithful bride. And Lord, I pray that we would be bold in living our lives for you, in proclaiming your goodness, proclaiming your gospel. And Lord, that you would continue to add to the numbers daily. So Lord, continue to build your church. Lord, continue to strengthen our hearts. Continue to help us be faithful to be called out from the world, to be strangers and aliens. And Lord, I pray that many might come to know you. Lord, we pray for this community. We pray for this neighborhood. That's why we're here. So Lord, we pray for the city of Coatesville. Lord, we pray for the families and the kids. We pray for this neighborhood, Lord, that you would be glorified. Lord, that this church and this, the the Bridge Academy would be a city set on a hill that can't be hidden. And Lord, that our lives would be that. So bless our time, bless the worship, bless your word, Lord. I pray that it would penetrate our hearts and we would leave this church, this building different than we came in. Because you did your thing. We thank and praise you, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. What's up, Providence Coastville? Yo, let's 
just worship the Lord tonight, okay? Let's just let go of everything, everything that happened this week. We're getting ready to go into a new week. And the Lord's been faithful, amen? We'll never stop being good. That's all he knows how to do. So we're going to start off singing about his goodness. Y'all are celebrating five years tonight, right? Come on, amen. Five years of his faithfulness. So, <laughs> so let's do that. Let's sing goodness of God. Sing. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay in my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Singing all my life. And all my you have been faithful. Y'all sound good. Come on, sing it out. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. You will let me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have slipped in the goodness of God. Singing on my life. Sing all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been, all my life, you have been faith. All my life, you've been good. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Come on. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender. tired you can sit down but yo if y'all want to stand we still worshiping y'all amen come on all right 
All right, we got a room full of worshipers. Okay, praise the Lord. Let's go. So we're going to sing this next song, Build My Life. Y'all Y'all know the words. This song is it's the reason that this church is still here, because y'all built your lives on the rock of his word. I think there's a mural right above me right now. I said that we do what he says, that we don't just listen, but that we're doers of the word, building our lives on his word, you know, like a man who built his house on rock, not on sinking sand. So let's sing that to him about his faithfulness and who he is. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. It's in Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you to the 
Y'all sound great, man. <laughs> so we got one more before Big Philly comes up and gives the word. <laughs> it's gonna sing a song about um, yeah, our hearts wanted to be refined by his fire, his holy fire. Our God is a consuming fire. And he purifies us. And honestly, this song is terrifying to me whenever I sing it. We're literally asking God to try us by fire. So we have to take these words seriously. Um, but we know that, you know, when we face various trials, that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. Amen. So we receive them with joy. Life ain't easy. Jesus never said that. <laughs> he said, in this life you will have trouble, but to take heart, because I've overcome the world. is where you meet us. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If you're looking for an offering, it's right here. My life is here. I'll be a living sacrifice for you. The fire I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you'll take whatever you desire, Lord is my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you'll take whatever you Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come, if your glory wants to come in, let it fall. We want it all. Lord, your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it a place. I'll be a living sacrifice.
Take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Your you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. You take, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we, we pray that, Lord, we sing that to you as a prayer from our hearts, Lord, that we would submit every area of our lives to you, God. Thank you for all the wonderful, beautiful, crazy, insane, only God things that you have done. Um, Lord, in this ministry, in all of our lives, collectively and individually, Lord, for your kingdom, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done, Lord. Use us. That's our prayer, God. We love you. Please bless the rest of the service, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can find your seats. Kids, children are dismissed to go down. While they're going, um, I don't have any announcements other than the announcement tonight is that Tonight, we are celebrating our fifth year anniversary. Amen. Isn't that? We can clap that up. If you look on the screen, it was March 26, 2017 was our first official launch service. Um, some of those ladies that are singing in the choir, they are here tonight still. Um, those kids in the children's ministry are, some of them are teenagers now, like my daughter, and... Um, Man, God has been so faithful. I was thinking earlier today, and, and this started from a burden years and years and years ago. I want you to know that my dad growing up would always say the greatest, most effective ministry in the world is the effective work of the local church in high crime areas. All the ministry we saw God doing, it wasn't until 2017 that my heart was finally led to trust the Lord in planting Providence Church Coatesville. But it was years of prayer, years of God's working and faithfulness. I was even thinking earlier today, probably 15 years ago, um, I was meeting with Dwayne and Steve. Steve's here tonight, raise your hand, and my dad and, and my brother and some other pastors locally. And we're like, man, what, what would God do if he would raise up a church here in Coatesville? And that never worked. It never happened. And um, Phil is here tonight, and... He kept giving me opportunities to preach, and everybody started liking my preaching more than his. And, um, and he was like, Josh, you should know. Um, but I did a residency at, at Providence Church Westchester for two years. And in that time, and me and Jordan prayed and committed it to the Lord. And in that time, um, the Lord just kept pressing on our hearts um, the need and his calling to, to plant this church here. And I was at a church earlier today. Um, Pastor Ernest, who's here tonight, raise your hand, Pastor Ernest. They're a, a pretty new church plant. They're meeting in his living room in Downingtown. And I was there today just being blessed by his preaching and worship and thinking back to probably six years ago now of some of the faithful people here like Jim and Barb Gemmel and Shannon, Shannon and Peter and Ellen Askew. And I, I don't keep mentioning names because we'll forget. I'll forget somebody. But uh, meeting in our living room and, and trusting the Lord, studying through Hebrews and um, trusting the Lord to, to, you know, raise up a church here and look at his faithfulness. Uh, one more thing I want to say before I introduce Phil. Um, in the past five years, we want to be a church that holds high the word of God, right, above all else. And in the past five years... We've studied, I mean, rigorously, I think, studied, because we take some time, don't we? Um, 
We've studied through Mark and Acts and Colossians and Philemon and Ruth and Galatians and Amos and First and Second Peter, and we're three chapters into the Gospel of John, four chapters into the Gospel of John. And um, isn't that incredible? And because his word never returns void, it always accomplishes that what is for, set out to do, set forth to do. And so we know that God's going to continue to do our, his thing. We just need to be faithful to walk in how he leads. Um, and so I'm thankful even for Scott Feather here tonight, a, a brother that's walked alongside of us since we planted, a faithful pastor from Gateway. I could keep going on and on. But God has been so good. Um, and that's all I want to say. We're going to, if you want to stay after, we're not going to do anything special but have cookies and soda. <laughs> it's like kids club, you know, <laughs> cookies. You get, everybody gets one cookie and one soda now. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's, it, he gets all the glory. And so we're going to just rest in that tonight. So it is a celebration, though. Um, I'm thankful for Phil. He's, been a, he's had a great impact on my life. And he was at our BACC banquet on Friday night. And I even asked him, I said, isn't it wonderful? Jordan um, was in his youth group. He probably has known Jordan since she was a little girl. Um, his, Phil's wife, Jill, mentored Jordan all through high school and college and discipled her. They did our wedding. Um, I mean, our, not our wedding, our uh, marriage counseling. That was really hard. <laughs> and, um, but he's just been a faithful mentor and discipler of me, um, walking alongside of me. And so I thought it would be um, uh, an honor to have him come and bring the word tonight. I'm, I'm grateful for him. Let me just pray before you come up. And I told him to take all the time in the world, so <laughs> buckle up now. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, this is just the beginning. Lord, I pray in 50 years from now, Providence Church Coatesville will be singing your praises and glorifying your name um, until you return or call us home. Um, Lord, bless Phil now as he brings the word to us. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. So I was noticing uh, in your list of books that you have not studied yet was the book of Revelation. So I figured tonight, <laughs> just kidding. But I will say this. Listen, a lot of people may like have different ideas of what the book of Revelation is about, but we all agree on how it ends. And I think that that needs to be a framework by how we live life. Because it gets hard sometimes, right? But the framework of the book of Revelation is what? Jesus comes back and wins and makes all things new. Amen? He wins. He wins. When people get all down, I'm like, book of Revelation. We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm getting all fired up. We just, right? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is coming back. He wins. He won at his resurrection. And now victory day will be when he returns. And the book of Revelation proclaims that. And so when we're making disciples and it gets hard, hard remember, keep looking through the doorway that our king is winning this baby. And in the, win, in, in the end, you'll feel that truly death Satan and sin has been defeated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come on, right? So I don't, I actually, I'm not going to get to show this at the end of my sermon because I'm going to run out of time. But do you know where Jesus declared that the church would be victorious? Do you know where that happened? Now, I took Josh to uh, Israel. We got to go to Israel together, and it was great. So we got to go to that place. Uh, it was up in a place called Caesarea Philippi. Did you forget that already, Josh? Did you remember that? But Caesarea Philippi, if you look on a map of Israel, Jerusalem is in the southern section where Jesus died. But when Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, he did it in the northern part of Israel. The most northern part, even north of this little sea called the Sea of Galilee. And you know what's unique about that place? Israel basically is a desert. 
But that place is unique. You know why? It's the base of a mountain called Mount Hermon. And at the base of Mount Hermon, if you can imagine it, it's gushing with, with water. It's gushing with all this water, all this water that's feeding the land of Israel. And it's in that place where Jesus said, disciples, come around here. I want to tell you something. See this place where all the water's gushing? Who do you say that I am? And that was a place of like where people uh, worshipped all kinds of idols. And he said, who do you say that I am? You know, Peter said, you're Jesus, you're Messiah, yes. And then he said, I have to go die. And Jesus said, you can't die. And he goes, I'm going to go. I'm going to go die. And, uh, and then he proclaims on his death and on his resurrection that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And 2,000 years later, we are here. We are here because of that promise. But he was doing it from a place where the water was gushing over the, uh, the land of Israel. So I got to show you a little, can I show you a little video of Josh? Okay. He makes fun of me every time he preaches. At our, in fact, I'm not a big sneaker buyer and Josh bought me, I'm sorry, Dwayne, sorry, don't get mad at me. Josh bought me Jordans. I don't like Jordans. So these are from Josh. I don't know, you would buy something else, right? Adidas or something like that? Huh? Zach's. Shaq's, who's that? <laughs> Never heard of that, Shaq's. <laughs> All right, so let me, let, me, let me create this context of uh, your pastor. Um, so, you know, you know uh, Josh can get pretty fiery. You know, he gets pretty fiery and he tilts a little bit and he can really, you know what I'm talking about? He tilts like this and he gets fiery and he's preaching. So I'm like, Josh, we're in Galilee. We're in the... In the, in the northern region, up in the mountains. And I said, Josh, we're going to go repelling today. And people are nervous. So you're giving the devotional. Get them fired up. Get them inspired. So Josh did his typical, we got to believe. We got to get out there on the cliff. We got to trust God. And I said, that's great. So finally we get out there and everybody goes down. And I turn around. There's one guy, like two guys left. So I interview Josh at the top. Do you want to see the interview? Yeah. Okay, this is in Galilee. Josh, you got, see Josh, you're in charge of the video and that's dangerous. So this is the top, this is in Galilee, <laughs> near the, just north of the Sea of Galilee. That's Josh, almost everybody has gone down and I'm just wondering what we're doing. So, so you feeling a little nervous? I'm you're, very scared. You're scared too, what are you doing? We don't even know, what are you doing? I'm about to go repel down this cliff. Um, I'm very scared, but I'm, stepping out in faith trusting the lord what did you teach us about this morning on the bus <laughs> i can't remember it this morning <laughs> only thing I i'll remind you the only thing i can think about is going down there <laughs> but you were preaching with passion that we need to believe we need to believe and what is believe <laughs> trust are you going to illustrate believe trusting right? what we can't see <laughs> are you going to wait let me say oh is this wait is this is this believe i'm eating my words right now <laughs> Okay. All right, so the good news is, do you have the next picture, Josh? You have the next picture? So the you feel a little nervous? No, nah, we don't scared. want to see that again. I did want to show you that he is, he is headed on the way down. Now, I will say this. He cried all the way down. <laughs> but we got, him, we got him down the mountain. So it was awesome time. We hope to get some of you there. Um, and it, it, it was great. But here's what I want to preach on tonight. If you have your Bible, since we're, you know, it's two weeks away. That's right. The resurrection of Jesus, where we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's Easter. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 26 and what's happening there. But because I was in Israel, uh, I just want to build up that, uh, how we got to actually Matthew 26. And I want to talk a little bit before that. I was talking about in the northern part of Israel is a body of water around Galilee. And to no surprise, that body of water is called the Sea of... Now, where do you think Jesus did 85% of his miracles? Around there, around the Sea of Galilee. Like, around the uh, top part there, that Jerusalem's in the, in the south, Sea of Galilee is in the north. Name some of the miracles, you can cry, you can yell out to me. Name some of the miracles that happen on the sea or around the Sea of Galilee. 
Whatever comes to mind. Feeding the 5,000, what? Still the sea. He walked on water. Peter tried to walk on water. Sunk the fish. A lot with fish. Throw your nets over. How about when Jesus made breakfast after his resurrection? Made breakfast, restored Peter. We were kind of close to that beach. You know what I'm saying? Um, lots happened. What do you think is the biggest miracle that happened around there? Here's what I think the biggest miracle was. That's all amazing. And people often say, hey, do miracles happen at your church? What's going on at Prov Coatesville? What's going on at Prov? What's a mir-? To me, the biggest miracle is, uh, that's where he found his followers. It, they were Galileans. They weren't from Jer- Jer- Jerusalem. Now, did you know Jesus was a rabbi? So Jesus is fully man, fully God. He was a rabbi. He's a teacher. Where do you think most rabbis, good rabbis, got their followers, got the good students? Where do you think, like, do you think it was in Jerusalem? Do you think it was in Galilee? Where do you think they went? Jerusalem. Why? The institutions were there. That's where the educated were, right? No rabbi goes to Galilee to get his followers. They're just fishermen up there. They're just ordinary guys. They can't start a movement. They can't start a movement that will change the world. What? Jesus, the miracle to Galilee for me, is this is where this is where Jesus started his movement. It wasn't in Jerusalem. It was in Galilee. I took one little show. I don't know, Josh, if you video took one little little video on the Sea of Galilee. Can I show it to you real quick? Just a little flavor of the sea. And this is hard to hear, but uh, listen to this for a sec, because you ready? Yeah. Here we are on the Sea of Galilee. Um, right behind me, uh, you see Mount Arbel, that, that ridge, that mountain, the high point on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Why am I bringing that up? Because uh, it says often that Jesus went up into the hills. In fact, he went up to the hills in this Galilee area to pray before he even picked his disciples. So most likely, as you look around, that's probably where he went to pray, a place of prayer. Why is this, in, this region so important? This is the region which he picked his disciples from the Galilee region. And so fishermen, ordinary men, they were picked to follow Jesus that changed the world. So here we are, Sea of Galilee, Mount Arbel. Let's give a hand to our cameraman, Josh Cran. He did, he did, he did, a, he did a great job. All right, so here, just picture this with me. We're getting to Matthew 26. So Jesus builds his momentum, picks his followers, and he says, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Why did he say we're going to go to Jerusalem? One, he started to explain to them, I have to die. They didn't like it, but I have to die there. But also, every good Jewish man or woman went to Jerusalem for the biggest festival ever or feast ever for a Jew, and that was called Passover, right? So we're in the Passover season now. So everyone's heading to Jerusalem for Passover. Jesus came to Jerusalem with his disciples in Matthew chapter 26. That's where we're at. So let's pick it up. Here's what happens. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he just had preached the Olivet Discourse about the end times in Matthew chapter 24, 25. It's a long sermon. He's, and, and powerful. He said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away. And then, and then Jesus begins to connect his death with the Jewish Passover. Jesus is a Jew. He's a rabbi. And he's connecting himself with him. He said, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then, and this is what's going on in the background, then the chief priests... And the elders of the people assembled in a place of the high priest. The high priest's name was Caiaphas. And this is what they were doing in a, they were like a back room kind of mob. I would say more like a mafia, I'm Italian. They're like a, a little mafia group. Let me just say this. Most people think like a lot of the Jews in Jerusalem wanted Jesus dead. That's not true. That's not true because we know when he came into the town on Sunday, we should celebrate this. Palm Sunday, 
a lot of people were saying Hosanna. A lot of the people were welcoming him as Messiah. A lot of the Jews were welcoming him in. It wasn't the majority of the Jews that wanted Jesus to be killed. It was a side kind of mafia back group that actually didn't want to create a riot so quietly they were trying to be uh, kind of bring collusion, plotting and fabricating stories to put Jesus to death. But then the chief priests, elders, people assembled a place, the high priest, his name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus what? What's the word? Secretly. They did not want to create a riot. And it says that. They didn't want to create a riot. So in the midst of all this craziness is an extravagant work that I want, to, I want you to think about with me. It's something that is extraordinary. Here's the term for extravagant. I want to define it, and then I want, to, I want you to enter this room with me that we're about to enter with a particular woman. Extravagant is this. Exceeding what is reasonable and appropriate. And um, I'm honored to celebrate five years because of God's extravagant work here. But I want to tell you something. I really believe this. Providence Church Coatesville would not be here if it wasn't for a few people that unreasonably and inappropriately, in a sense, were willing to lay their lives down for Jesus. In a way that people would say, don't waste your time on that. Don't waste, your, don't waste your energy on that. How are you going to afford that? That doesn't even make logical sense. That doesn't fit the plans. That's not the way I would do it. It, it takes people whose hearts are filled and gravitated and, and being immersed by the extravagant love of Jesus for churches to be planted and sustained by God's grace. And it is the Lord. And, and he is faithful, and he is faithful, and he's faithful working through people that are willing to pray crazy, wild prayers like Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified <laughs> with Christ. That's extravagant. That's not reasonable. Some would say that's inappropriate. You've been crucified. With Christ, and here's the key. Therefore, Prov Coatesville, it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. Boy, let that be our prayer. Can I just say to some of you, thank you, thank you for being willing to live from an extravagant place of saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but the energy you feel in me, the fuel you feel in me, the love you feel in me, the passion you feel in me is the Christ that lives with me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way this thing goes down. That's the only way this thing goes down. So when I, when I stand up here with you all, can I just say, I celebrate the faithfulness of God, of filling by his grace, ordinary men and women with his extravagant, unreasonable, some would say inappropriate, the disciples didn't want him to die, love in such a way that you're willing to lay your lives down every day for him. That's why, that's what we celebrate. We're selfish people. I'm a selfish man. I have to be changed by the extravagant love of God. Well, anyway, you're going to see something that is exceedingly this way and extravagant in the midst of the collusion, the betrayal. Think of what happened to Jesus. Think of the disciples. Think his last week, his last week of his life. Even the disciples, it just wasn't Caiaphas. It just wasn't the elders. The disciples betrayed him. Peter denied him. He get, next week he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and like they can't even stay awake. Like it's rough on Jesus. He's alone. So it just wasn't like, oh, just, it was everybody. Let's just be humble. It was everybody. But in the midst of this, you see this extravagant worship. It says in verse 6, Matthew 26, while Jesus was in Bethany, which is just over the Mount of, of, of Olives. Oh, we didn't show the picture of the whole group, did we? That's uh, all right. 
While Jesus was in Bethany in a home of Simon the leper, which is amazing because Jesus was always hanging out with really messed up people, it was illegal for a Jewish person to be in the midst of a leper, which means this guy was probably healed by Jesus. It's pretty cool. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. And what did she do with this jar? Here's some of the extravagance, the something that ex, that's exceeding what is reasonable or appropriate. She poured on his head, she took the perfume, she poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. It says when the disciples, in my opinion, as you look at this whole text, especially verse 14, Judas was stirring things up, acting like he was religious. The disciples saw this and they were indignant. And they're like, right? How many times have we seen this when people want, this is a waste. This isn't reasonable. This isn't appropriate. You know, Judas is acting like, and I have a really good reason to tell you, like, we should take care of the poor, right? It's a religious front. Instead of his heart getting changed by Jesus, he uses a religious front from his own heart and greed being touched by the exceeding love of Jesus. Don't we do that sometimes? We act religious when underneath there's a whole heart issue that's messed up and we won't let Jesus there. <laughs> that's what Jesus is doing. And he's stirring the other guys up to it. He says... This, perf for, per this perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Yes. Aware of this, Jesus protects this woman. Jesus said, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. Now listen, I want to be clear on this. It's not that Jesus isn't for the poor. Because we are called to be for the poor. But let, listen, hear this clearly. If our mission is about the mission of helping people without the death, burial, and resurrection being in the middle of it, we've lost our mission. And I've seen that happen. People are talking about what we need to be doing, but the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because our hearts are being changed by the extravagant love of Jesus. Providence Church, Westchester. There's a place where at the middle of it is the death, burial, and Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And out of that, we take care of people. The poor you always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. For burial. He's proclaiming his death. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we are thousands of years later, and we're still mentioning it. So I want you to, just for a moment here, bear with me. Uh, I want you to enter this room with this woman. I want you to picture this extravagant act of worship in which she is invited into this room and to this intimate gathering with the disciples. And she, and I want to be clear on this, she has a calculated plan of worship and anointing her, anointing Jesus, excuse me, as her king and Messiah. So probably... Um, it says that Jesus was reclining, so they would lay down on the ground. They didn't have seats and sit around a table. They would lay down on the ground. And so that their feet were not close to the food, their feet were, was facing the, 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 uh, the back wall. You get the picture. Their heads were towards the middle as they were eating. Because don't, don't get your feet near my food, right? Get your feet out, right? So feet are out, heads are down. And most likely, the women who were in the room were sitting on the outside of the room. In fact, in John, it's, John names this woman. Some people think maybe it was a different anointing. I don't want to get into that. The point is, just picture this. Then Mary took, Mary, who's Mary? Mary is the sister of Lazarus. Mary is the sister of Martha. 
It says, and Mary took a pint of pure nard. So, you know, I just brought this for an illustration. She had an alabaster thing of a pint of this. Some people think that Mary had this for guess who? Her brother, Lazarus. But he didn't have to use it. She didn't have to use it for Lazarus, maybe. So she still has this, this expensive perfume. It says, and Mary took out a, a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. And it says uh, that she poured it on the feet of Jesus. Matthew 26 says, it was also poured on his head. That This woman in the middle of this room um, calculated an incredible, extravagant offering for Jesus and didn't really care what anybody thought. And she takes this and she pours it on his head and anoints his body for burial and on his feet. And then it says this. And then she wiped his feet with her hair. And Prav Coatesville, I read this to you and I celebrate five years with you because when I see a woman, and it says in the house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume, the whole, it was a strong perfume. When I, when I think of you at the center of Prav Coatesville has been the extravagant love of Jesus poured out on you as a people. And I see a people that have been willing, whose hearts have been transformed by the extravagant love of God, willing. Now, I don't have hair, a lot of hair. But hear the humility of this, willing to take their hair out, whatever that means, and get on their hands and knees and anoint and bless the body of Christ. And then my question for you is, what is the body of Christ? Well, I don't have his physical body here. She could pour this out on his physical body and in humility. The body of Christ is the church. It's the church. And I celebrate with you the faithfulness of God, of people in this church that are willing in humility and extravagance to be on your hands and knees and serve the body of Christ the way you have. I feel humbled by that. And I was wondering about this. It says that this was expensive. How expensive do you think this was? How, how costly do you think this was? Some people think, does anybody have any ideas? Some people think that, the, some people believe that it was about a year, a year's a year's worth of, were you there this morning? Yeah, right. People, people double dip. It ain't right. No double dipping, man. Some people, some people think it was, it was a year's, listen, a, can you imagine? One year wages. One year wages being poured out on Jesus. So many of us would be like, what do you, what? What are you doing? But I really believe that this woman's life had been so touched by the love of Jesus, by the life of Jesus, the extravagance of Jesus, that I don't think, yes, it was costly, but I really believe that it didn't feel like a sacrifice. I don't think it felt like this was so, I think for Judas it felt like sacrifice. Judas is like, oh, you know what we could do with that? You ever do that? You give and you're like, oh, you know what we could have done with that gift? Oh, not for her. She is naturally pouring it out. And the other thing I love about, about this woman is, is she doesn't fear what anybody else thinks. People are like, why are you doing that? Don't do that. Jesus protected her and said, leave her alone. She doesn't fear what anybody else thinks. And I just, I just wonder, I just wonder as we are a church serving Jesus, if we lack extravagance, and guys, I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm talking about calculated honor and worship and our hair being out and our willingness to extravagantly serve the church with our lives. I wonder if we lack that kind of extravagance because we fear what people would think. 
Well, you're just crazy. Well, you're just fanatical. Well, that doesn't make sense. And sometimes I watch young people get fired up for Jesus, and the people that can be the most discouraging sometimes is maybe their parents saying, but if you sell your life out like that, how are you going to pay your bills? Well, if you go to Bible college and learn about the Bible, how are you going to take care of yourself? And so we, we can put a, a damper on what's happening. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Leave her alone. And I hope that after five years, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, that Providence Church Coatesville will continue to be filled up with this extravagant uh, gift of people giving their lives. Why? Because their hearts are being changed by the extravagance of Jesus. So just let me say this. Let me get this from you. I want a little feedback from you, and then I want to I tie this to Passover. And I promise I won't keep going and keep going. But I want to this, tie this to Passover. When you think of this woman, what words come to your mind? You can yell out. Like, when you think of her offering, what words come to your mind? What's that? It was sacrificial. It's devoted. It was, there was something pure about it. It was pure. She didn't, she was not, she just let it, it just float out. Brave, courageous, humble, humble, yep. What's that? Compassion. Beautiful, right? Can I say this to you and don't miss this? Where the reason why it was pure, the reason why it was, it was genuine, the reason why, listen, all of our hearts are twisted and messed up, even this woman. I really believe this. I think Judas, look at verse 14. Judas went out and he sold. He was greedy. He went out and right after this passage, he went out and he betrayed Jesus. I think Judas was watching this. I think he had an opportunity, listen, for his heart to be transformed. Because what is the miracle of this church? There's a lot of miracles. People have prayed things. God's provided things. Maybe there's been healings. But the greatest miracle of Prof. Coatesville right here in this church, the greatest miracle that happens is God takes our broken, messed up, sin-stained hearts, and he has the ability to change it with his extravagant love and transform it in a way that what is coming out of us is the pureness of that kind of motivation because of his work in our hearts. Amen. Now listen, I want to prove to you that God is miraculous. There's a picture I found, or no, where, Jordan, where are you? Jordan sent to me. This is a miraculous picture. Now look, <laughs> or someone got that. Does anybody know, does anybody who know who that is? Now, at Prov, I showed this at Prov Westchester this morning. People did not know who this was. <laughs> they didn't know. I'm not going to say why. I'm not going to say why they didn't know. But do you know who that is? Justin Bieber and <laughs> listen, listen, Dwayne and Josh, you guys all look good still. Don't worry about it. But listen, here's one thing. Do you, do you notice the difference between then and now? I was thinking about this. You know what the difference between then and now? They're a lot more muscular. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, you're a lot more muscular. But here's, here's. Here's, here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. There's an incredible group of people that helped start this church, and we celebrate that. But I just want to point out these two men. Listen, it's not about their, 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 the way they lay down their lives. It's about this. Somebody, somebody who was filled with the extravagant love of Jesus went after these men. Like that woman. That's right. And we know that's a miracle because we know what they're capable of without that. Right? They're two messed up dudes. But I'm telling you. And so we all are. But this is the miracle of Jesus. This is the miracle of Jesus. This is what we celebrate. Josh, you got to just give me some five. I don't, I've totally lost five. All right, ten. Um, <laughs> All right, let me just say this, because I want to tie this. I want to tie this. Let me tie this to Passover. Because why are they in Matthew 26? Why are they in Jerusalem? Passover. 
How many, jo uh, Josephus, uh, um, let me just say this. Slow down, Phil. Flavius Josephus, historian during the time of Jesus. Fascinating, Jewish, not a believer. He writes about Jesus. You should read about him. Do you know how many Jews came to Jerusalem for the Passover? He writes about it. About how many? Those of you who were there this morning, 2.5 million. Now listen, 2.5 million Jews would come to Jerusalem. How many, uh, let me just do some math with you. Out of every 10 people, they needed one lamb to celebrate Passover because they would sacrifice the lamb to celebrate what happened with the Jews back in when they were rescued from, from the Egyptians. So if you take 2.5 million divided by 10, how many lambs is that? 250, thank you, mathematicians. They're like, I know math. I may not know English, but I know math. 250,000 lambs were slain on Passover. Why do I bring that up? And let's just tie this together. Because Jesus Christ, when he came into Jerusalem, began to link his life as the ultimate Passover lamb. Why do I bring that up? When you read the Old Testament, just stay with me here. When you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is what? It's a beautiful but incomplete picture of God's work. It's incomplete. And the sacrifice system was incomplete. How do we know that? Because they would make sacrifices for what? To cover over sin. To cover over sin. But then when Jesus showed up, his cousin, his flamboyant, crazy, wild cousin, John the Baptist, sees Jesus and doesn't see him. He grew up with him. He said, let me tell you who this is. And John, he said, did you preach on this? He said, behold, the Lamb of God. And what's his next statement? Because Josh preached on John 1. Who what? No, it says he covers over. Oh, no? Covers over, right? No, takes away. Do you understand? In that language, that was completely radically different than what they heard in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was cover, 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 keep sacrificing. John the Baptist shows up. John says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is our Passover lamb, right? So it's so cool because in a Jewish household, when they would celebrate Passover, the children had a little job and they had to say, what makes this night so special? And the patriarch of the family would get up and say, this is when God has rescued us, right? There was a, the angel of death passed over, passed over the doorway and all the firstborn sons were killed and it broke the back of the Egyptians and we have been set free. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here, Coatesville, as a church celebrating the fact that we have what was that? What, that wasn't right. I'm preaching in, what was that? Okay, there you go. There you go. All right, so let me, let me, let me, Peter's put it this way. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world. And I love this. When did Jesus plan this? When did Jesus plan to die for you? Listen, I'm going to end my sermon, but just look at me. When did Jesus plan to die for you? Before the world was created. He, you, he didn't have just, oh, he was not reacting. Our God is in control. And he's thought about you before the creation of the world to be chosen, to be part of his family, to be part of a mission that's changing the world. That 20 years from now, 30 years from now, maybe we won't be here. But you know what? There will be a legacy of faithful people walking with Jesus, building a church in Coatesville because of God's faithfulness. And he says this, but he, but, but was revealed these last times for your sake. Here's what I'm trying to say. I think Judas had an opportunity for his heart also to be overwhelmed by the extravagance of the love of Jesus. But Judas went religious. And he threw up a barrier. And his heart wasn't touched. And we have an opportunity. Because when Christ said it's for you, when he came to this earth, it was for you. 
And when he died on the cross, and he removed sin as far as it is from the east and the west, and he doesn't just remove it from you. By his grace, he imputes you with the righteousness of Jesus. That's what he sees, the righteousness of Jesus. And when he went to a grave, it was for you, and he thought about you. He thought about you. And when he resurrected, he thought about you. And when he ascended, he thought about you. And now he fills you. He fills you with this extravagant love that energizes life and changes the world. And we are the body of Christ filled with this extravagant love. So we take out our hair. <laughs> I don't have any hair. And in this place of like, God, I'm all yours. I have been crucified with Christ, therefore it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives the, the Christ that lives in me. That I am honored by his grace, by being surrendered to him, to be filled with and fueled by this extravagant love so I can continue to serve the body of Christ. How about you? So I just, listen, here's, what I, here's a little challenge. Spend a little time this week in the room with this woman. And just, listen, I could give you a, lot, a list. Here's how to be extravagant. But you know what I really believe? This woman heard it from the Spirit of God. I don't think somebody told her, hey, you should go get the most expensive oil and maybe that was supposed to be used for your brother. And poor. I think she heard it from the Spirit. And I want you to spend some time with the Lord and say, Lord, what does extravagance mean for me? And listen to me, though. Please do step one. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ and understood that he came and he died for you and, he, and he, he died a death and he experienced all the sins of the world on him and he took it on and he felt all of it and he paid for it all in full and he resurrected on, on the third day and defeated death. If you've never trusted in Jesus, that's where it starts. We're not talking about legalism here. We're talking about something that's fueled by him, but you have to be fueled by him by trusting in what he's done for you first. So if you haven't trusted in Jesus, please, that's where it starts. Just ask the Spirit of God this. What does extravagance look for me, Lord? Just ask him that. Let him speak to you. I don't know what he's going to say to you, but I know for this woman, she didn't fear man. It was calculated. And it's still being told today with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I thank you for this congregation, and I feel honored that they let me be here tonight. I just pray for an anointing over this church. I pray that Prov Coatesville will continue to be filled with a family being fueled and being poured out with the extravagant love of Jesus. And I pray people, when they see this church, they'll say, it doesn't make sense. I pray when they see this church, they'll be like, that church is overly generous. I pray when they see this church, they'll be like, how can that church remain resilient? Even when they're going through hard times. And Lord, I pray that it's a church that we will continue to uphold and hold high and give glory to Jesus. And we, this church will be an aroma. Some people say that smell that was on Jesus, that smell, that aroma, it was so powerful that it stayed with his body all the way right to his death. Some people believe that. That's how strong this aroma was. Christ says that we are the aroma of Jesus over Coatesville. Let this church be the aroma of Jesus over this city. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And Josh told me, thanks for letting me go a little over. Josh told me that there's people here to pray to, so maybe you just need some prayer about this, and it would be helpful for you to pray with someone. So wherever you are, um, and thank you, Matt. This would be great. Father, we thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. How you've spoken to our hearts, God. We want to please you, Lord, with our lives. We want to pour ourselves out, Lord. It's a sacrifice of praise, Lord. We want to bring
than ourselves, living sacrifices unto you. Sing when the music fades. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you and it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for It's all about you, and it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. King of words, King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart so i'm coming back i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you and it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for It's all about you, Jesus. I'm 
I'm sorry, Lord, for being I made. Then it's all about you. Then it's all about you, Jesus. It's all, it's all about you, Jesus. No one else. It's all about you. Lord, we come back to you, God, tonight, remembering our first love, Lord, that we only love you because you first loved us. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that you are our first love. You sent your son for us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And how we can identify with that, with his sacrifice, Lord, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now, I live for the one who loved me and died for me. Lord, help us to embrace your word, Lord that truth and continue to use this this church lord this part of your bride god i thank you lord for this outpost here in coastville lord i pray that you bless this family and uh, continue to do do your work here lord we love you be glorified in jesus name amen amen ship all that good stuff and there's like snacks and stuff so yeah do that <laughs>